Hey friends, uh, good morning. It is week four uh, lectures to begin now. I've um, been reading through much of your work. I'm going to be uh, doing some serious grading over the next uh, 48 to, to 72 hours, uh, getting some things knocked out for you, get some things back to you so you kind of know where you're standing. Uh, just kind of looking at uh, several things. Uh, I'm really impressed with the work that you're doing and the way in which you're wrestling with the the uh, the information so far and the kind of uh, transformation I think that's taking place in your mindset as far as the nature of the church as the church finds itself in the culture that we live in today in the West. Um, a couple housekeeping notes. Um, as you can see, I've been kind of uh, forgiving when it comes to uh, uh, some of the due dates. Um, part of that is because I'm, I'm running behind myself. And so I understand when you're living life in the fray, when you're pastoring and you're, and you're doing all of these things as well, um, I get it. So, uh, so I'm trying to, trying to create some space and some leeway. Just make sure you're staying up on things. I do want to, I'm going to extend one piece of grace here that, uh, that I think you'll appreciate. Uh, in this course, there's two books assigned, the book Sentness and the book Faithful Presence. Uh, both of them do a phenomenal job of just sort of laying out some different postures for missional living. But I understand, I think I think the, the reading has been pretty heavy uh, as far as the amount of it uh, throughout this course, and I may have overshot the mark just a little bit. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to ask you to pick one of those two books. Uh, they're both worth a read, but as far as uh, giving me a reflection, I'm going to ask that you pick one of those two books, uh, that you read one of those two books, and that you give me your reflection on one of those two books, Faithful Presence or Sentness, and that you get me uh, those reflections within those that two-week span that uh, those different books are uh, to be utilized. And so uh, that'll, that'll hopefully give you a little bit more leeway to get caught up on maybe some of the other reading, uh, jump out ahead and uh, uh, on some other reading that you're doing. Um, I really encourage you to, to stay caught up on that. Um, so this week, we're going to be spending some time talking about leadership, missional leadership, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to share some stuff with you today, post some videos later this week. Uh, hopefully I'm, I'm looking, I, I thought I had found one, but, uh, uh, but it's a little long. And so I, I don't know that I'm going to utilize that one right off the, right off the get go. So I'm going to hopefully be posting another, uh, video or two a little bit later this week and give you something else to reflect upon, um, other than just my voice. So, uh, one of the things we've been talking about is the, is sort of the paradigmatic shift that's taken place, uh, in our culture, um, especially as it, as it pertains to the church. And that's sort of rooted in a shift um, from sort of the modern mindset of the West uh, in modernity. Um, modernity is a, a philosophical paradigm that shaped uh, our understanding of of the way we exist in this world uh, from about the late 1500s, early 1600s through much of the 1900s. Um, the world was so seen through the eyes of uh uh, a physical world of natural law and, um, and what I'll say is sort of a me mechanical approach to existence. Um, and I'm not going to, I don't know how much philosophical background you all have had, so I'm not going to get you bogged down in a lot of the information. If I was teaching this course uh, on a week-long uh, sort of intensive, we would really get into this because I think it really affects and shapes how we understand the world in which we find ourselves. But I'm going to say this. So the modern world is a, is a world of natural law. It's a world that is shaped by um, what, what is called foundationalism, uh, reductionism. It's this sense that once you can sort of drill down with reason to the, to the barest essentials, uh, you can begin to understand how the world operates mechanically, and then um, you can sort of predict the outcome. So if I know how the world exists, and I understand the laws behind the ways in which the world exists, then all I've got to do is then and be able to predict the outcomes and in some respects uh, manage those outcomes. And that's sort of the modern project is how do I manage the outcomes of this world based upon what I understand through reason and experience uh, and how those, how those shape uh, my ability to, to either predict, control, or manipulate outcomes. 
So the modern world was shaped by that. Um, that affected the way the church understood its mission in the world. Um, it affected the way in which we read our Bibles, and it especially affected the way in which we understood our leadership. So in the modern world, uh, the leadership model in the modern world and in the establishment model that we've been talking about in this centripetal model that we've been talking about is very mechanistic, which, which means um, sort of it, it, has, it has in this in its uh, core, a uh, sense that a leader exists to figure out what, what the moving parts of the mechanism are. And once those moving parts can be figured out, once those, once, once the best operational mindset can be de determined, then, then the leader is to, uh, cast vision and to control, um, uh, the organization in order to achieve what was considered predictable outcomes. And so in this, this sort of model of leadership, it's very top down. It's very hierarchical. It's very um, controlling. So command and control is valued in a modern world in, and in a centripetal model of, of church ministry. And so if I, if I come with the assumption that, that the leader is the one who has figured out all of the answers, and then that, those set of answers um, then are, are sort of disseminated down to the rest. So, so in this modern world, in, in this modern form of leadership, in this world in which we find ourselves uh, sort of on the backside of, which is this this modernity shift into post modernity, um, and I'm boy, I want to make sure that if you have any questions regarding this modern shift to post modernity, um, I'm going to try to work this out over the course of these lectures. But I, I don't want to miss any questions you might have uh, regarding that. So please, if you if you need to ask questions, please do. Um, in this shift, uh, the, the, the book Surfing the Chaos uh, states that there's three presuppositions regarding modern leadership uh, or what I would call top-down uh, leadership. And that one is leader as the head or of the organization. So intelligence is centralized near the top of the organization. So it's, it's located amongst the CEO or the one in control or the top senior leader or his or her senior leading team. And that, intel, that intelligence is sort of held there. And then they're the, sort of the brain trust behind what happens, behind, behind the actions of the organization, the business, or even the church. Church. And so then what, what they have to do is figure out um, what needs to happen next because all of that, in, that intelligence is centralized, it's located at the top. And, and then they figure out, so it operates on the premises of predictable change, which means once if, if the world is one big mechanism and all I've got to do is figure out how the parts work in order to control the ability to be successful in achieving the mission and the vision that I want, then all I've got to do is set these things in 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 a way of managing uh, these predictable changes. So predictable change is the implementation of plans that are scripted on the assumption that you can, there's a reasonable degree of predictability and control during, during a time span. Okay. So that's a sense that, that, uh, that the way modern leadership worked is that you had a sort of high level top down leadership model in which all of the vision, the dreams, and the mission came from the top. And then it's what is called the, the, the assumption of cascading intention, which means um, once the, the top, the top of the organization who has figured things out, uh, who has controlled um, the intelligence, who has predicted the outcomes, and who has cast the vision, they then disseminate, disseminate this uh, throughout the organization. So the organization exists as cogs in the leader's machine. Okay, so what happens is that once this cascades down, then they're supposed to accomplish the 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 leader's goals. And so so the, the leader determines the vision, the leader determines the mission, the leader uh, determines the next steps. Um, everything comes from the leader and then goes back to the leader. And so within this this model of leadership, of course you can see that there's there's command and control. Um, there's everything the buck always stops on the desk um, and usually becomes the filter for every decision that anybody in the organization might make, even if people in the organization may see something different than the leader sees or even have value that maybe the leader doesn't understand or doesn't see. And so, uh, but, but that all has to be filtered through the leader's desk. Like they have to be in control. They get to make the final decision. They are their team uh, of, of senior leaders. Um, so, so you can see this sort of in the CEO model. Um, you can see this in, in businesses all across 
uh, the country, but you can also see this in churches. So we have senior pastors, right? And they have executive pastors. And, and not that these titles are bad. It's the way in which we utilize these titles. And so the senior, the senior pastor is the one in charge. They know what needs to be done. They cast the vision. They have the mission. Then they send and disseminate that out throughout um, the rest of the staff or the rest of the lower level leaders. And it's talked about in that regard. These are lower level leaders. And those lower level leaders that need to accomplish what, what came from on top. And their, their um, stability in the organization is based upon their ability to accomplish the goals that have been established for them by the senior leadership team. And that senior, senior leadership team becomes the filter through which all activity within the organization uh, can, can, can happen. So, uh, with, so you end up with these sort of um, these sort of superhero leaders at the top of an organization that if there is success, all of the accolades go to that senior leader. Uh, if there is failure, it's because of something that the senior leader did. Um, and so, uh, and, and oftentimes, too often in this model of leadership, uh, those when there is failure, uh, that failure is usually blamed down the road towards lower level leadership. Now the praise comes to the senior level leadership, but the 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 failures are probably because there was some parts down in the lower level leadership uh, that uh, that that uh, uh, that caused that failure. And so so I want us to understand that within the modern world, in a mechanistic world, in a world that assumes that that everything operates according to laws and that once you can drill down and find the the smallest pieces and how those pieces operate and affect and influence the pieces up once you can do that and determine with a great degree of certainty how those pieces will affect uh affect um uh, the mission or the vision of an organization, then you control and manipulate those pieces in order to get a set of predictable outcomes, which in a mechanistic world and a natural law kind of world seems to make sense. And all you need is the right leader in the right spot at the right time who understands this world, who can cast a compelling vision in such a way that the outcomes, uh, once predicted, can be manipulated, controlled, so that success is the guarantee. And so you see this a lot within even the church growth movement is that there were all sorts of assumptions that if we have these strategies, these keys, these tactics, and we put them in place in the same way, in the same places, that you'll get the same outcomes regardless of context. Uh, because, because this is the way the world works. These are the way people work. And if you can start with that assumption, then, then you feel like you can control and and uh, maneuver and manipulate the outcomes. And so so that's what I would want to say on the front end is that we understand first off and foremost that in this modern world there is an assumption of control uh, based upon a predictive way of understanding the world shaped by our understanding of modernity and uh, and sort of natural law and mechanistic worldview. Um, and it has created a lot of a lot of tyranny um, at top level leadership. And so what what I want to do, uh, as we move forward through these lectures, is to propose a different way of being a leader. And so that's that's number one, just understanding the modern worldview and the sort of the tyranny of the top-down level, uh, especially as it relates to ministry. We'll come back to, to lecture two here in a moment.